I'm here today, by the way. So, um, let me first. I hope this doesn't work. The sound? You have a sound problem? It's the beard. That's why. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, this is what I do. Ironically, I will show you a paper book. Although I know uh, hardly anybody in this room reads paper books anymore. At least I don't. And you all have iPads and Kindles and all kinds of machines. But the boring thing with showing a computer screen or something is that it's not a physical object and we're still attached to those. So this is just in case you want one. And this is non-profit, by the way. This is the American publisher of my work with Young Senecas. They, they bundled all three books together into one. And they cleverly called it the Futurica Trilogy. And I'm going to start then with that title, the Futurica Trilogy. Why that? Because Futurica is a new, necessary literary genre. It's the mixture of philosophy and future studies. I started out doing future studies in the mid-1990s, especially with the support of Shell and others at the Stockholm School of Economics. But what I ran into was that the ongoing internet revolution that is really taking over everything right now in the world, is of such a profound quality that we need new concepts to understand it. The words and the ideas we already have are not sufficient to understand the new phenomenon. And this interesting love is exactly what philosophy is. Philosophy is the art of constructing new concepts to better understand the world. It's the exact opposite of poetry. The poet just says even more words all the time. You know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, they're poets. The philosopher is the neurotic guy. He's the guy who tries to grab something and nail it with words. And even if it's impossible, at the end of the day, he does his very best to do it. Because what we can do with the work of philosophers is that we can use their ideas and put them on the world and suddenly it all makes sense. We find patterns and we understand what's going on. And that's what I'm going to try to introduce to you today. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go really old school here. I'm very tired of PowerPoint, by the way. I come from the music business. And giving a speech using PowerPoint is the equivalent to performing a concert playback. <laughs> Everything is prepared beforehand. You go out there on stage and you realize, I might as well have sent them a YouTube clip instead, because everything is like minute by minute prepared. What I can do now with you here, since we have an hour, is that you can interrupt me, just shout whatever you like to do, and you actually, you become part of the performance. We can actually interact. So I've gone back to using, say, a blackboard and a pen, you know, like a traditional teacher in a school. Now, but you're going to be nasty, angry children. You're not going to be well-behaved at all. So if you want to interrupt me, you're welcome to. So I'm, I'm going to start today with a guessing game. Let's have this square. This is the biggest meeting place in history. Meeting place for human beings in history. And you all use it every day. When you go online, you use this every day. What is this? It, it, it's a page that has two columns. It has a larger column to the left and a smaller column to the right. What is that? No, no, no. Facebook is too boring. Come on, something bigger and better than Facebook. What's bigger than Facebook? What do you use every day, all of you? Huh? If you were Chinese, you would have said Baidu. That would be fine. If you're not Chinese, you should say Google. Yes, Google. That's the Google page. The Google page has two columns, a larger one to the left and a smaller one to the right. What do we use the Google search page for? We go there because it's our gateway to the online world. It's even the gateway to the world. Trust me. Because we live in a world today with an enormous amount of information. <coughs> Everything is available to us. We know that in theory, if you, if you put your hand down in your pocket right now, you probably have a smartphone there, an Apple or an Android, right? Or maybe a Nokia. So, you know that that smartphone contains all the information ever produced by humanity. You know perfectly well that there's more information in your pocket right now than there was on the entire planet in 1975, before the internet. We all know that, but we're totally exhausted knowing that because, yeah, but how do I find my way through all this enormous amount of information? And that's the trick. That's where Google comes in. That was what our first book was about when we published it in the year 2000, and five years later Google exploded. They simply found a model to use this. They realized we're not going to produce anything. We're not going to produce products. We're not going to produce services. We're not even going to produce information. We're just going to sort information for others. 
Because the world is going to be one big ball of confusion, which is exactly what it is today. So we go to Google and we trust them, because at Google we find two columns. And these columns, if you fill in a word here, like Lithuania, Vilnius, restaurant, then we will have two columns which give us suggestions of where to go. They will go through millions of different hits and discover exactly where we should go and give us these suggestions. But why are there two columns? Why isn't there just one? Ah, that's an interesting question. And my hypothesis in my work is that this is because we live right in the middle of a paradigm shift. We're right now going from one type of a society with a certain worldview and a certain idea of what it means to be a human being into a completely different world with a different worldview, with a different power structure, and with a different concept of what it means to be a human being. Otherwise, Google would not give us two columns. They would be happy to give us only one. Okay? You follow me now? You see, the thing is today that you don't have to agree with me at all. It's going to be really hard for you not to agree with me once we're finished. So, we have two columns. They probably expose one paradigm each. Let's go to the left column first, because it's slightly bigger and it's to the left. Okay, what happens here? Who gets to number one here? In the left column. Most relevant. Hmm? Most relevant source. Most relevant source, exactly. And what do we mean with relevant? Well, actually, there was nobody who done this work before, before I started doing it as a philosopher. Nobody looked at what actually happens in the left column. What does Google build their algorithm on when they put this information in the left column? They build it on a, a principle which now in sociology is called attention. AT. French word. And in English that would be awareness multiplied with credibility. These are the two things we're looking for when we go online. Awareness is the first one. So if you're on a restaurant in Vilnius, that means if you run the restaurant that most people know about, at least as a restaurant and not anything else, then you'd be top in that category and you'd get high scores for awareness. Credibility is the other part. It's, is it a good restaurant? Have you been there for dinner? Was it pleasurable? Did it give you good service? Did you meet interesting people? Maybe you met the love of your life. All of those things add to an experience which then adds credibility. So attention can be measured empirically by how long, how often do you go to a certain website and how long do you stay there once you're there. That's exactly what Google's algorithm does. So, we love the left column because we are looking for relevance. All the time we go online, the way to find out, go through all this information is by trying to find a pattern of relevance that's relevant to us. And what, what's important, relevant to other people, is usually relevant to us as well. So we love the left column. Now, next thing. What is really interesting about this relationship, because this is what the internet is all about. From now on, the rest of your life, in your company, in your entrepreneurship, you're going to be obsessed with attention, because everybody else is. All the friends you want to find online, all the companies you want to work with, and all the customers you want to reach out to, are all looking at attention as the main driver of everything. The interesting thing here is, do you see a dollar or a euro sign in that diagram? No. Guess why my speech today is called Life After Capitalism. That's how revolutionary the internet is. There is not a single dollar or euro sign here. Not that the euro is worth that much anyway in the, anymore. But, yeah, they're not here. Now, let's look at the right color. It's slightly smaller, but it's still there. Who is number one here? The highest bidder. You're absolutely right. That's the capitalist column. This is where the dollars and the euros go. Now, we all know one thing, since we were small children. There is no way a human being ever is going to pay for something when they know it's free. Right? There's no way to give away money to somebody. You wouldn't do that. Especially if somebody's trying to sell you something. So, who is in the right column? The desperate guys. The desperate guys. The losers. The guys who don't see any other way of approaching this huge mess called the internet to try to get in contact with customers and colleagues. The only way they can do it is throw money at their problem. 
So if you run a restaurant in Vilnius that nobody knows about, and that's a really horrible restaurant where nobody wants to eat, you're going to try to find an investor from Sweden who's stupid enough to put money into your restaurant so you can get into the right column on the Google page. Now, here comes the really nasty news. Google had already sort of served us off in a direction telling us that the left column is slightly more important and slightly more popular. They've already told us that by making it slightly bigger. Do you know what the traffic looks like at Google? The traffic is this. Over 98.5% of all traffic goes to the left column. And less than 1.5% goes to the right column. Now, you remember this the next time you go to the Google search page, because that's exactly where you start your internet experience. That's where you fill in the word or the name of somebody who you're really curious to find out more about. And you're all going to go to the left column. Hardly any one of you is going to go to the right column. And you know perfectly well when you see that page. Oh, the guys in the right column. They're desperate. They're throwing money at a problem. Capitalists hate this. That's why they hated me, and that's why Shell loves me, because he's an academic and not a capitalist. They hate this for the simple reason that when I started doing this in 1998, I killed the dot-com companies. I say the dot-com companies are old capitalists who have money in their pocket, thinking they're going to conquer a new medium, when that medium actually is financially for free. How much does it cost to start a Facebook page? Zero. How much does it cost to start a blog with WordPress? Zero. <laughs> How much does it cost to open a Twitter account? Is my sound gone? It's okay. okay. How much does it cost to open a Twitter account? Zero. So we end up here realizing that Internet is operating towards zero cost. Just to prove this empirically, I went to Andhra Pradesh in India. Andhra Pradesh is about a thousand times the size of Lithuania, but even less known, because it's in India. And I went there in 1998, and I could empirically prove that every village in Andhra Pradesh in 1998, 14 years ago, provided free internet to every citizen. Not even half the villages had running water. That is, again, empirical evidence that there was a revolution going on. So the internet is operating towards zero cost. Now, if it's operating towards zero cost, then the question is, what does it then cost to get online and be successful? What does it take to be successful online? And this is where networking comes in. Because networking here is everything. What had been done in terms of internet research before I stepped in, in the late 1990s, basically that in Sweden, you would go out and you would ask engineers at Ericsson. You know, Ericsson was this old, big technological <coughs> company. So at every time they would go there and ask the engineers, because they're men and they're 55 years old, and they would say, so what's next in terms of technology? And these guys would go, well, we invented 100 new things that we put into the next generation of our cell phone. Now, we all know that we don't care. Because technology to us is just boring. We know that out of 100 new innovations put into a new smartphone, we're likely to use maybe one that we think is great, and the other 99 we leave out. So I took my tiny budget and instead decided, why don't I look at the internet as a social phenomenon? And in that sense, the innovator is not the guy who puts technology into a smartphone. The innovator is the user. And who is then the first user of any new innovation in the world? And I discovered it's a 17-year-old Korean schoolgirl. She's probably Lithuanian today. So I went to Korea. I did my studies. And I realized I got a completely different answers from what 55-year-old male Swedish engineers would give me. So I could do a completely different way of introducing the internet to people, including killing dot-com companies, as I did. And what was it about the Korean schoolgirl? Well, you know, if you do good sociology, you have really abstract questions. You're not too concrete. And one of those things we asked the Korean schoolgirls was, who are you? That's a very abstract question, but it's a very profound question. Because whoever you are is something that's decided by others. If you get the question, who are you, you would probably summarize what other people have told you. And the funny thing was, the Korean scholars wouldn't answer the question straightforward. They would pick up their cell phone, and they would hold their cell phone in their hands while they were thinking. Now, behavior is always more honest than words. This was the answer. 
they totally identified with their cell phones, and this was already 14 years ago. There is no way none of us now doesn't identify with our smartphones. If you walk out of your house in the morning and realize you forgot your smartphone, you're completely naked, abandoned, isolated. You're completely untied from the rest of the world. You're a nobody, and you can't work or anything because you don't exist. So you have to run home again, get the fucking smartphone somewhere, and once you see your hand, you're you again. You have to become who you are again. Now, this is really, really radically different from what we had before. We're creating a very different society where we can empirically prove that we moved on to intentionalism rather than capitalism. We can all look at this and we can say, yeah, that's the way it works. But what are the consequences? The consequences are enormous. They are enormous. Because if we're going to hit it right, if you're going to take your time and energy, look into the future, and make the right decisions for you in your life, you don't want to base those decisions on the wrong assumptions about the future. You want to have the correct assumptions. And the irony here is that it's actually really easy to find the right and correct assumptions here, that most people don't. Actually, hardly anybody does it right. Why? Because... When it comes to values, we are conservative. The vast majority of people on the planet live a life that's radically different from their parent generation. That they inherit the values of their parents and keep those values with them and even try to protect them instead of letting go and find new values that are more appropriate for the new environment. So what we need to do here really is to rewrite history and we need to go back to previous paradigm shifts and look at what happened then to get the key that we can open up into the future and understand what's going on at the moment. 1807. What about 1807? The year 1807, an angry Corsican dwarf is riding on a horse through Europe with his hand underneath his coat and a big hat. And behind him is the biggest army the world has ever seen. It's called Napoleon. And when Napoleon comes to Eastern Prussia, to the town of Jena in Germany, of course all the Germans hate him. They hate his guy. He's a French guy, so they hate him. But there's a guy in there, there's a genius called Hegel, one of the biggest philosophers of all time. The one maybe I aspire to be now, but I'm really not. Hegel was a huge philosopher, and what he saw was a Weltgeist. He saw the future walk into the town of Jena. Napoleon to him was the future. Because what Napoleon did was that he provided the world with a new model for how to organize things, whereby you could create a much more prosperous and also more complex society than anything we'd seen before. And since then, the metaphor is called Napoleon's army. What then happened, especially in Germany, ironically, in the 19th century, was that Napoleon's army was used as the model to organize everything else in a society. And it was a brilliant model. It was really, really brilliant. Why? Well, that goes back to the real revolution. The real revolution happened in the 15th century. The real revolution happened very close to where Hegel lived in southern Germany, and it was a guy called Gutenberg who did the real revolution. Forget everything you heard about the French or Russian revolutions, they're not the real revolutions at all. They're just chaos. They're just messes. The real revolutions are always technological, and they always happen long before we get the bloody revolutions. The printing press is the key here. Why? Well, look at the Europe we had before Gutenberg arrived. Have you got any idea what it cost to make a single book in Europe in 1450? You're going to make one copy of a book like that Futurica did. One copy. You know what it cost? Well, yeah, the, we, the thing is, you had to go to a monastery, you had to see some monks and nuns that were like really snobbish, because they got book orders all the time, you know, and they could actually write, which hardly anybody could. So they were like, you know, like Swedish investors, they were like, oh, I am so special, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you had to go there, and they'd give you an offer, and you see the offer would be something like 150,000 euros for one book. 
That was the average cost in today's value of a book made in 1450. Ben Gutenberg came along in Germany. He invented the printing press. Do you know what the cost was of the average book in 1550? Besides the fact that over 300,000 monks and nuns around Europe had become unemployed and redundant, which we love, <laughs> we get rid of them. Besides that, do you know what a book cost 100 years later? 30 cents. Now, if a book costs 30 cents to make instead of 150,000 euros, that means you're probably going to make far more books. You're going to publish more titles. There's going to be a lot more people around who can afford to buy a book, and if they can afford to buy a book, they have a reason to learn how to read and write. So we get this huge feedback loop where the arts of reading and writing are being spread all over Europe. These things take time, but once they're on the move, they move. And the genius of Napoleon was not the fact that he was an angry dwarf from Corsica, or that he was ruthless, or that he had the biggest army ever. The genius of Napoleon was that all the soldiers in his army could read and write. It was the first army ever seen in history where the soldiers could read and write. And a soldier who can read and write is a hundred times more efficient as a killing machine than a soldier who can't. That was the brilliance of Napoleon. That's what Hegel saw. We have entered a new paradigm where all people in our society can read and write, and that's going to completely transform society because we can build a far more complex society where people can have access to far more information than they used to. They will even have a voice. They will demand a voice once they can read and write. That's exactly why democracy doesn't work in societies where we can't read and write. So this developed over the 19th century. We saw this explosion. And the model looks like this. You've got the dwarf at the top. Then you've got some generals. Then you've got some other officers here. And then you've got the cannon fodder at the bottom. That's a hierarchy. Yes, it's a hierarchy. It's actually the most efficient hierarchy humanity ever invented. And the reason why it's so efficient is because it has intense information flows and they're all going in one direction, from the top down. Simply because that's the only way information can flow because this is mass media. Books, newspapers, and eventually radio and television are all, socially speaking, mass media. There are very few agents who can speak. Even in Sweden, as, as late as 1987, there was only one state television channel, and they would have all of Palma on every day and say that this is our great leader, blah, blah, blah. It's not that different from North Korea and Kim Jong-un today, you know. That was Sweden only 30 years ago, so not only Lithuania has changed, but Sweden has changed a lot too. But information flows look this way. That was the only way you could. If you think about it, you've got a book publishing business, or you run a newspaper, or you run a radio station, or even a TV station. This is the only way information can flow through your medium. And the brilliance of Napoleon's army was the fact that it used this type of information flow to create actually more egalitarian society with more wealth than anything ever seen before. So we got all the institutions. We got the armies of Europe copied, the French army. We had the nation states, like Lithuania and Sweden eventually. We had governments. We had factories. We had companies, corporations built this way. Not only that, we even built our prisons according to this model. We built our schools according to this model, with teachers feeding kids information. And finally, the last of all these institutions, by now you realize they're all in a state of crisis, the last one left, the most conservative people on the planet are the doctors. The only place in Lithuania or Sweden where you still go somewhere and they tell you to sit quietly in a corner for three hours and wait for your turn while reading a 30-year-old old ladies' magazine and being totally degraded as a person is the hospital because for some strange reason doctors think that hospitals were invented for them. So they could look glamorous and have a lot of sex with the nurses. Whereas the rest of us know that hospitals are really invented for us. So we go online and we order the medication we want to have in Lithuania. It's sent to Sweden, delivered four hours later, and we don't have to go to the doctor anymore. So even the hospital is collapsing. All these institutions have collapsed. Why? A little devil came into the game. Napoleon's army worked brilliantly 
until something happened, starting in California in the 1970s. A little genius there, we don't even know who he was, realized that if I connect my computer to my friend's computer, they will really be one computer. And then we get connected to a third friend, and that will still be one computer. Wait a second. We can put tables into walls and connect all seven billion computers on the planet and turn them into one giant computer. Voila, the internet has arrived. The scary thing is that we invented the monster. Now the monster has taken over us. There's no way we can stop it. And just like any other monster we created in history, the internet creates enormous possibilities for us, like Google and Facebook and all these free tools we can use. But the internet also creates monsters like Al-Qaeda, in Japanese suicide sites. In Sweden, the number of young girls who go to see psychiatry emergency clinics has quadrupled in the last 10 years. Because they've been freaked out by everything they find online. So, we should be humble, stay neutral, and just realize that we let the Hydra out of the bottle, and now the Hydra is controlling us. Because what happened was, this system worked brilliantly for 150 years, without any interruptions whatsoever. Until we started to connect with each other, because what happened then, is these guys here started talking to each other. They started commenting what Napoleon would tell them, and, well, I don't like that doctor. I'm not going to see him again. I'm never going to see that hospital again. No, 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 no. Let's get out of there. I'm not going to send my kids to that school. That's a terrible school. They have really bad education. It's expensive, too. It doesn't have attention. Blah, 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 blah. And over the last 30 years, what eventually happened was that, boom, this was cut off. It was cut off. I have my friends to talk to. They're experts on lots of things. I can go to Google and I can search and I can find exactly what I want anywhere in the world, have it delivered to my door within 12 hours. This is truly not a global village because of the internet. I don't have to pay any attention whatsoever to the old, local, patriarchal... <laughs> the old, local patriarch, exactly. I can completely ignore him because of the internet. I work with a TV show in Sweden called Idol. Have you seen Idol? It's probably everywhere. It's probably doing it too. The only reason people still watch television is because they now participate in it. So the whole point with Idol is to put somebody like me, like a Corsican dwarf in the jury, and I'm going to be really mad with all these kids coming in thinking they're superstars, and then the audience are going to go, oh, well, he's not excited there. We're going to vote for the guy he hates the most. Because we decide. Otherwise, we don't watch. <laughs> we believe. And Alexander can sit there on his own with his stupid TV show and have a big flop. The old media now have to copy new media to even exist. We don't have CD records in Sweden anymore. Everybody goes to Spotify. We don't have TV channels anymore. You go online, you go to the web, you find all kinds of pictures and sounds. You don't need TV anymore. You leave because internet is swallowing everything up. But it's not only swallowing mass media, it is swallowing everything else too. Because unless your company has a really cool and hit presence online, people don't even know that you exist. And if they don't know that you exist, they can't trade with you. So we look at a very, very different reality. And the problem here is that we get stuck here when in reality we should move on to the new society. We should move into this column and look more to it. And hardly anybody does. That's the scary thing. Do I have a clock here? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry about that. I always run over. Sorry about that. So where are we at now? We need to understand what's so profoundly different between these two societies. Ah, there we go. Where do you live? You probably answer that you live in Vilnius. Maybe Stockholm. You live in the city. Do you really? Do you still have cards? You know, these little paper things where you have your name and your postal address on it? What would you need those cards for? I gave mine up five years ago. I'm on Facebook. As long as you remember my name, you don't need my card. And by the way, I don't live in a postal address anymore. I have no idea where my postal address is because I don't get any mail. I get email. We have moved. We all now live in cyberspace, literally. 
None of you came here today without first deciding online you were going to go here with your physical body. It doesn't mean your physical space has disappeared. It only means your physical space becomes secondary. It's completely directed from cyberspace. You decide who you are. You shouldn't meet your future husband or wife online these days. Everything happens there first. That means you move. Just like we moved from the village to the city, we're now moving from the city to cyberspace. We live there. We used to run industries. Industries, really. Yes, they're now in Bangladesh, southern China, and maybe there's one left in Sweden somewhere. You know, they're not in, none left in southern Europe, that's for sure. We moved on. We're no longer controlled by industry, we're controlled by media, and I give you the absolute evidence for that. If you hold a mineral water bottle in your hand, and you know you pay two euros for it, just because your neighbor is stupid enough to do that, too. You pay two euros for it, actually pay three cents for the water. And you pay 19, you pay 197 euros for the rap, for the media. For the media to tell you that that mineral water ban existed in the first place. That's what it takes. We used to run the world using money. We don't. Attention is now driving money flows. Money goes to the Zuckerbergs and the Brins and the Pages out there who have an idea that's so brilliant that it attracts social attention. Then the money has to come with them because they have access to the big networks. They have access to people. People listen to them. You pay them to bring your message forward. The fact that you made the product is now completely secondary. You are now producing the water to be filled into the mineral water bottle. That means the mineral water bottle brand owner is going to make the money, not you. So attention goes there, we moved on. We need a whole new system. And whereas nations like Lithuania and Sweden did, did matter, they no longer do. They no longer do. Because online, the presence actually for both Lithuania and Sweden is minuscule. But the online world is full of what we call subcultures. Young people today organize themselves in interest groups. This is really the golden age of sex and cops. You should found a new religion right now because it's actually an excellent opportunity to do that. Because any theory you look at right now, how the internet is organized, that if you have a really wild and beautiful and wonderful idea, people will cling to that idea and they use it as an excuse to socialize together and meet their next dates or whatever. The really successful subcultures online are now driving everything. And corporations around the world are now chasing them to hopefully be able to put their brand into that subculture somewhere because that's the only way to access the customers of the future. So the subcultures have taken over. Your question is, which subculture do you belong to? And here's an interesting thing. I live in Sweden. Everybody in Sweden speaks English. I'm working a lot in Holland. Everybody in Holland speaks English. Still, over 99.5 of all tweets in Sweden are in Swedish. Over 99.5 of all tweets in Holland are in Dutch. And I'm pretty sure over 99% of all tweets in Lithuania are in Lithuania. No matter how nice it is to talk to your neighbor, that's not a very successful formula for making a lot of friends around the world. So I would, if I were you, I would already now go on Twitter and look for Lithuanians who already tweet in English. Because they're probably the future leaders of your country. Just one little thing, just think. If you think global, if you think global connection, if you think I'm going to make friends around the world, you're on to something here that most people completely miss out on. I personally, whenever I meet somebody, the last thing I say to them after they've given me their card and I give them my digital, I tell them, from now on, I want to be your ambassador in Sweden. Because Sweden is one of my subcultures. It is a network for me that they're probably not connected with. And since I know just about everybody in Sweden, they'll call me. If they have something to figure out in Sweden, they'll call me and I say, yeah, I can tell you as long as I can charge you first. This is all about networking, and this is what networking does. If you only look this high, you're not going to reach higher than that. If you only think of yourself as a local entity, you're never going to be on that local entity. But if you think there, your access will be much, much wider. <laughs> Here's the most interesting aspect of all this. Individualism. The most famous tweet of the 18th century was made by a French philosopher called René Descartes. He tweeted, I think, therefore I am. What was interesting here was what he didn't mention. He 
basically said, this is the foundation for my philosophy. And he was the first philosopher, at least in the West, who removed the word on which everything up until then had been based, namely the word God. He didn't kill God. He just made God redundant. He said, I think, therefore I am. But he repeated the word I twice. He invented individualism. And we become more and more individualistic because we become more and more Napoleon's army as time has moved on. We become more and more efficient, more and more Napoleonic until the internet arrived. And this is why we have the biggest generation gap in values today in Western Europe between 40-year-olds and 20-year-olds. Because the 40-year-olds go to the gym. They work on themselves. They work on their self-improvement. They work on self-realization. They're going to be something different, something better than what they already are. Everything's going to be improved in their lives. They're totally obsessed with themselves. They're narcissistic and they're individuals. The problem is, the kids are not. The kids are not. Because the individual is what you become when you pick up your own book and you turn on a lamp and you read that book or you pick up a newspaper and you read that newspaper and you consume the information. That's how you become an individual. But that's not a strategy that works online. The kids today are individuals. Individual is Latin for undivided. Individual is a person who is dividable. It's a person who can manage to have many different personalities within the same body. Schizophrenia is now a winning formula. The more personalities you can have, the more successful you are, because the more subcultures you can belong to, and the more subcultures you can be successful inside. That's a result of the internet. That's exactly why so many 20-year-olds today become entrepreneurs. But they don't become entrepreneurs for the reasons they used to. We used to become entrepreneurs so we could get wealthy, because the guy who had the most money when he died won. That was my parents, my dad's universe. 20-year-olds today in Lithuania and Sweden, they start companies so they can do fun things together with their friends and hopefully make a little profit. That's a radically different attitude towards entrepreneurship. And that's exactly why they start companies. And that's why we have to endorse them and support them when they're doing exactly this. Because this is what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. To them, running a corporation for profit is meaningless. But running a corporation that's socially responsible, that understands ecology and sustainability is absolutely key. Actually, none of them will ever go to work for a company that doesn't have a functioning corporate social responsibility policy. That, that's unheard of. That's it. I would never, ever work for a government or a company that didn't, that didn't give me an opportunity to be socially responsible and connected with the world in a sustainable way. Because if the planet dies, the internet dies. So we arrive there, and what we see here is that we see we moved on from the idea of eternity that we had before the printing press. Whatever happens to you after you're dead is important. We moved on to the idea of progress. Your children will be better off than you are. That's why you should work every day for the rest of your life. It was called social democracy in Sweden, it's the same idea. Progress. But progress is no longer the driving force. The fact that your company is growing will not mean that you get any more customers and will not attract the best staff that you're looking for to employ your company. What they are looking for is what's called an event. They're looking for a place where it feels like everything is thriving, like things are happening, like you're involved in something that's going on, that's cooking. And you know what? It's not because they're young. It's because they're a different paradigm. Because the internet operates exactly the same way. And we have now, as people, started to reflect the internet. We are becoming the internet. That's how revolutionary this new technology is. Am I running out of time, by the way? No, I'm not. Good. Let's look at history. To understand ourselves better, we need to go back in history. Stone, bronze, iron. Three prefixes. Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. We've all learned in Lithuanian and Swedish schools that there used to be a Stone Age, and then came a Bronze Age, and then came an Iron Age. This is how we constructed history in the past. We still do, unfortunately. They don't in Korea, but we do. Now, 
Do you think Stone Age people were aware of the fact that they lived during the Stone Age? You're laughing. And still your kids are being taught in school and you're playing them today. Of course there was never a Stone Age. It's a much, much later innovation. Now if you Google human history, where did we first find the term the Stone Age? We discovered it was first used in Europe in 1850. In the 1850s. Actually, all three terms have been invented at the same time. When Napoleon's army was exploding as a model for how to run the site. Now, if you were a historian in the 13th century, you know about the time when this was in town. You would probably write a history saying that originally there was Adam and Eve, just like the two guys who followed the ambassador here, like there were the Adam and Eve of business with Lena, you know. Adam and Eve, they were the first two guys, little blonde and gorgeous looking and all that. So, we had Adam and Eve first, and Adam and Eve and a snake, probably me, okay? Adam and Eve and the snake got bundled together in kind of a crazy swingers love story of some kind. It was really messy, and God was very upset about all this, and you wrote this history. Why did you write this history if you were a historian in the 13th century? You wrote it because the Pope paid the bill. Okay, historians always do that. You know, they're kind of nerds, and they need their money. So they will write whatever history is needed to fit the power structure of a given society. That's the great thing with history. So if you go to the 1850s, why do historians suddenly talk about the Stone Age and try to find evidences that there had been a Stone Age in Europe? They do so because somebody pays their bill to write a certain kind of history. How about this? First we had stone, then we tamed bronze, then we started making iron, and one day we built a factory. The factory owners in the 19th century paid historians to write a new history. Now, if we don't have a lot of factories around anymore, may I suggest that we skip these concepts and write a new history that's more relevant to us, since we pay the historians now. And we're all metocrats sitting here. We're all using the internet. We all have friends around the world. And we have friends of friends around the world. And we're networking. And we put all our companies online with web pages and Facebook pages and WordPress and everything we use. And it's all for free, but we're so creative. We have such great ideas that we're expanding. We're expanding in Lithuania. We're expanding outside of Lithuania. We can pay the historians now to write a history that flatters us. What is the radical thing to do? This. Info, society, information, calm society, communication, and network. Three cliches, I know, but philosophers love cliches, because cliches really reveal a lot about what's really going on. They're usually true. And we've used these three terms over the past 20 years to describe what's specific with our age. What was so genial about historians in 1850 was that they applied the idea of industrialism of all of history and said all societies have been industrial. That's why we change stone, bronze, and iron into tools. Because everything is about industrialism. Okay? Let's repeat that wonderful endeavor and say all of history is about information. We as human beings never change. Our genetic makeup is identical to what it was 100,000 years ago. The only thing that changes is technology. Think about it. The only thing that makes your life different from your parents and your grandparents and six or ten or twenty generations before them in Lithuania, the only thing that makes you different is that you use technology in a radically different way from what they did. Everything else is the <coughs> same. Okay. So we make this move. All societies have been information societies. Every one of them. What makes a human being distinctly different from an ape is the fact that we're a talking ape. So we have one paradigm there. Spoken language. Then, 5,000 years ago in current southern Iraq, somebody realized that if I write down the symbols of spoken language, I'm even more than talking. I'm right. We invented written language, and the amount of information available exploded. Because whenever an old, experienced person died, we could interview them before they died, get the information out of their head, save it on a piece of paper, and build on their experience. We created civilization. Civilization is the art of not repeating the previous generation's mistakes. And then, go to 
Rosenberg in mass media is a third type of society. The printing press. Again, the amount of information available to us explodes a million times over with the introduction of the printing press. And then we get a completely different society. We move from the village to the city. We build nation states. We build democracies. We build parliaments. We build all the things that we're familiar with us today. The values we have today are entrenched in this terror. What then happens is that we do introduce a fourth way of communicating between human beings. So the internet is a fourth paradigm of history. The amount of information we produced in one year, the year 2008, was bigger than what humanity had produced in the entire human history up until the last of December 2007. That's why we are drowning in information. And that's why when you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, you need the guy with the magnet to find it. And that magnet guy is, for example, Google, and that's the guy you pay. So we have these four paradigms now, and this is the one we should focus on. And what we have to do is to sit down with the 20 year olds today because they are the first generation who no longer only have to have learn how to use the internet, they've grown up with it. They are the internet, <coughs> And they're going to keep their values and valuations with them for the rest of their lives. So that's what we're going to be. And your question is, where does Lithuania, Vilnius, Restaurant, or your company for that matter, fit into this picture? You are only as powerful in this society as you are known and you are credible to others. That's the key. That's where you build your company from now. Did you? You're so polite. Oh, I have got one minute left. Okay. <laughs> so who are the winners here? We go to the subcultures and look at how they're structured. So, here we go. We're getting a new term. One of the biggest illusions about the internet is that this is a transparent phenomenon. It was a very nice idea when the internet arrived in a big way in Lithuania and Sweden in the 1990s. Because we all knew that the old cannon fodder of Napoleon's army started talking to each other and they left the army. They walked out, did the wrong thing, and we arrived in the internet. Everybody can start their own blog today. The only thing that prevents you is your own ideas and your self-confidence. You don't need the money to start. You don't need the money to start anything. Because the capitalists will come running after you as soon as you have followers. As soon as others look to you, they will come with their money. Don't worry. That's what they do all the time. But, now let's look at something like Twitter. Some people have 14 followers on Twitter. Others have 4 million. Some people have 14 Facebook friends. But another Facebook page that costs exactly the same amount of money, zero to start, has 4,600 friends. We are not equal in the internet world. This is the world of social monsters. This is the world of social and emotional intelligence. Your capacity to empathize and feel with other people is going to pay off enormously. If you sit there on your own and you're being narcissistic, saying, well, hey, I'm Alexander Barr and I'm extremely powerful and all that, nobody wants to talk to you anymore. They're going to cut you off, throw it out of the Facebook groups, and you're dead. Napoleon is dead. The cannon fodder is dead. But not all cannon fodder is equal. Because the way we socialize with each other, it pays off to be what I call a netocrat. That's why the first book is called a netocrat. We get netocrats here, but we also get what's called concentrarians. <coughs> the concentrarians are the new underclass. The concentrarians have 14 Facebook friends, out of which 13 added them out of Lutheran or Catholic guilt. <laughs> they don't communicate with anybody. They maybe watch porn or something really tragic online. They play games where they don't play with anybody else. They're completely alone, and to them, the internet is a ghastly thing that keeps them out of the world. These are the people that politicians and schools should concentrate on from now on, because there is no digital divide. The divide is digital. It's online. We are all online, but what we do there is radically different. 
So what we get, unfortunately, so we do get a new class society. We get the concentrarians down there who watch TV shows and play cheap games. But at the top of this, we get a new world elite. We speak English, travel around the world. Some of them are Lithuanian, sir. Look at the TED conference phenomenon. Are you a speaker of TED? If you're a speaker of TED, you're certainly an editor. You don't get invited unless you are. So what we do get is we get an autocracy at the very top, and they will rule the world because we get a new pyramid. But the new pyramid is not between individuals like the old one was. The new power pyramid is between the networks themselves. So what you need to do if you want to be successful is not to go home and blame yourself for not having enough friends or not being social enough or not understanding others emotional enough, although that could be worked on. No, what you need to do is to go home and say, what quality does my friends have? Who do they know? It's not actually the number of Facebook friends or followers and Twitter you have, but actually who follows you? Who's involved with you? Where do they live? What networks do they have access to? That will determine how successful you are in network society. No wonder the kids today freak out and are obsessed with networking, because networking is what they should be obsessed with, because their whole personal future is completely dependent on it. You are your address book, and you are nothing besides your address book, from now on until the day you die. That's where you are. That's where I'm going to end. Speech. Thank you.